Hello, this is the last video in this series on quality controls and uh, we will conclude the whole section on 5.6 and we will deal with 5.6.3 interlaboratory comparisons and the mechanisms of interlaboratory comparisons in it and we will also briefly talk about 5.6.4 comparability of examination results. So, let us start with 5.6.3 interlaboratory comparisons. We already talked about this in the earlier video and uh, peer group comparisons. So, we will go into the uh, details of uh, other registered uh, mechanisms and at this point I would like to caution you that peer group though it is an extremely useful mechanism, it is not at this point considered as an equas participation. So, at this point uh, I need to put a word of caution here. You may have your peer group but at this point it is not considered as a valid interlaboratory comparison under the heading of proficiency testing or uh, external quality assurance. So, you, if there are registered equa programs, you have to register in that. So, let us look at the what the standard talks about interlaboratory comparisons. Standard says the laboratory shall participate in an interlaboratory comparison program such as external quality assessment program or proficiency testing program appropriate to the examination and interpretation of the examination results. The laboratory shall monitor the results of the interlaboratory comparison programs and participate in the implementation of corrective actions when predetermined performance criteria are not fulfilled. The standard then goes on to say the laboratory should participate in interlaboratory comparison programs that substantially fulfill the relevant requirements of ISO IEC 17043. So, that brings to your attention that there is another standard applicable here just like we have our 15189 standard there is another standard called 17043 for the ISO. The Providers of this external quality assurance program should comply with. Provider of your proficiency testing has that accreditation that gives it much more uh, validity and please look for such programs if they are available. Try and participate in those programs which are accredited to 17043. Now we will ask that question why interlaboratory comparisons? So, the answer to those that question are external quality assurance monitor the accuracy of the laboratory's methods on an ongoing basis. It enables the lab to compare itself with others using the same method for the same analyte. Essentially, EQUA involves the use of same sample in several labs and comparing the lab's results with that of others performing the same test by the same method. We will see all of these things in shortly. Participation in EQA enhances the confidence of the lab in its results. It also enhances the user's confidence in the lab they use for their test. So, it's, it has got multiple advantages. It gives you a guideline about your accuracy on an ongoing basis and also it gives you the confidence that you are on track. And so, it is about the EQA provider gives you a sample and that all we will see the mechanism of EQA in the, in the next slide. So, multiple types of interlaboratory programs can be adopted. The first one is PT or EQA which is a proficiency testing. Then you have third where you can exchange the samples to other laboratories. I have put these arrows here because we will only be talking about those where the arrows are there. And the other alternative approaches mentioned are certified reference materials can be used when you do not have any EQA program running for a certain analyte. Samples previously examined that also can stand in for your uh, EQA provided there is no other registered EQA programs. Material from cell or tissue repositories, repositories for those kinds of tests and control material that are tested daily in inter laboratory comparison program that is your peer group we already discussed in detail. So, this also is part of your EQA program it can be considered a part of your ILC program, but as I said earlier this becomes valid only if no other registered EQA program is available though it for your ongoing performance evaluation this is a very valuable method. 
And so let's look at how this happens. So if this is a PT or an equa provider, that they will give you samples. These are for samples and this arrow is for sample. The PT or equa provider will give samples to the laboratories. All the laboratories will be supplied with the same sample. The laboratory will analyze the report and give the values back to the equa provider and the equa provider sends a report back to the laboratory. So there are the participants here is very many so the unlimited participants there can be hundreds or even thousands of participants is the value of the sample is unknown it is a totally blind sample which is a great advantage and the frequency variable. Some of the equa programs are giving you monthly samples. Some give you bi-monthly two samples in a month, but some of the equa programs are only quarterly or even once in four months. As of now, what I am talking about is what we have available in India. So some of them have got a less frequent sample distribution, uh, which is not a good thing. More often you get a sample for blind analysis, the more confident you will be about your testing. So this is your ILC option number one. PT slash equa and second is your peer group we have seen this slide very many times by this time in this case unlimited participant again very many but the sample is a known sample and frequency is you are analyzing the sample daily and you are finding the mean and it is a known sample that is the difference here the peer group and here again this is the values and this is the report you feed in your values on a daily or a monthly whatever the schedule is a QC provider. And at the end of the month, they will give you the report and you can look at your analytical performance using that. And the third option that we have talked about is exchange of samples. So the exchange of samples, your lab has a sample and you send the sample to other labs and they send you the report so that you can compare yourself with the other labs in that group. So here the problem is that participation will be very limited. We will talk about this N or the number of participants when unless you have a certain number that is not a robust number that you are getting. So we will talk about the inadequacies of this in a later slide but if you have no other option there are no other cost programs available in your area or within your proximity. In that case you can think of exchange of samples and we will talk about this later on. So these are the three things that we are going to talk about in this video. And now let us discuss each of these things. Let us start with uh, the interlaboratory comparison, the type, first type that we talked about which is your PT slash equa programs. Okay, the, here how does it work? The PT provide, we already have been talking about this, so this is like a recap to what we have been talking about. PT provide a sense laboratory several samples from a common pool, unknown values. Each laboratory analyzes these samples just as they would analyze the patient samples. Each laboratory reports its results to the PT provider. The PT provider evaluates the results according to specified criteria, very important specified criteria. The PT provider notifies each laboratory as to the quality or the proficiency of the results in a report. So what are the steps here involved? Now again I am assuming that you do not have any equa program or a PT program at this point. And so we are going to talk about that. Check out your PT equa options for the required test. Check out the schedules, the frequency of samples, very important that you need to know that. Check out the N or the number of participants. Check out the report attribute. Check out the types of calculations and computations. And of course, check out the cost and talk to your management because they are the ones who have to finally decide. So you need to understand the basics of how you would want to select your equa program before you want to get your management involved in this. So it is up to you to find out a few basics. We will talk about what are the basics that you should know uh, when you are selecting your equa program. So again before and we will come to that in a little while. Before that we will talk about what the standard has to say about running the equa samples. Okay, the laboratory shall establish a documented procedure is number one. You have to have a procedure about how you are going to process your samples. You have the reconstitute the samples if you are getting the samples in lyophilized forms. You need to reconstitute carefully as per the PT provider's instructions. Run along with the routine samples just like routine samples. No special treatment is to be given to the PT samples because there are many self-defeating mechanisms people employ 
you are validating your analytical system. Of course, you will look good if you have a good EQA report, but that is not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is to understand if there are any instabilities in your system. So don't do any kind of self-defeating things that I'm going to talk about. It's not my idea. It is a standard which says that these, should, these things should be avoided. First is that don't give it any preferential treatment, just put it along with your other samples so that you, the sam this is run as a patient sample. Why so? Because if you have a patient sample, you are not going to give it any extra special care. So if you are going to make a mistake with the spatial sample, that mistake should be reflected in your requa also so that you know that you are making mistakes. To be run by the personnel who does routine tests in the equipment, there is no special person who will run your requa sample. If XYZ is doing your every other sample, XYZ will also do your equa sample. And to do not run more than one time, just once. Some people run it two times, three times, and then pick and choose and decide, oh, this may look good, this may no, don't do that. You're not going to run your patient sample three times. You'll only run it once and give the patient the report. The same way you will do it with the equa sample. Do not resort to any self-defeating actions like sending your equa samples elsewhere. It's a so frequently done thing, so this should be avoided. It's not about looking your equa reports looking good. It's about your analytical system being rectified. File your own reports. Do not discuss the results with any neighboring labs. You may have the same sample with your in your labor's lab also, but don't go and ask them what was your value and don't take any kind of shortcuts like that. And the third aspect is, so first one we talked about procuring your requa and we'll come to the details of it in a little while. Second one is about running your requa. It's very important how to run it. All those things that the standard talks about, you need to comply to. Third is reviewing your requa. And reviewing your requa, the performance in the interlaboratory comparisons must be reviewed and discussed with the relevant staff. It's not like you'd have send your requa, you get outliers, you just don't look at it. No, you have to look at it and it has to be discussed with the people who have reconstituted the sample, who have run the sample, who have filed the reports because mistakes can be hidden anywhere. So you have to discuss the problems with whoever has been involved in filing that requa. When the predetermined performance criteria are not fulfilled, that is non-conformity are present, staff should participate in the implementation and recording of corrective action. So that is also an important thing. The effectiveness of the corrective action should be monitored. It's not the next time over you have to see did your corrective action work. So that has to be monitored. The return results should be evaluated for trends to indicate potential non-conformities and preventive actions can be taken. I'll show a slide on this, this we discussed in the previous uh, slides also. So if you are starting to show your results are showing some kind of a trend, it may not be an outlier, but you have to look at it and take appropriate preventive action so that you, before it actually becomes a problem. I hope you know about corrective actions and preventive actions. Corrective actions are done to make sure that the problem does not recur. Whereas preventive actions are done to make sure that a problem will not occur. So that is the difference. Prevention of recurrence is a corrective action. Prevention of occurrence is your preventive action. So that is something which you need to keep in mind. And so that whenever you start seeing a trend, do appropriate preventive action so that there won't be any kind of a non-conformance later on. So. One point that I forgot to mention in the previous slide is that whenever you are doing an equa and filing your reports, maybe it is a machine printout that is present, you have to file the raw data. These will be audited during your assessment because this is one area that we have said that this is kind of a self-defeating practices are there. So you check with somebody else, you may not file the report that you got, but you would file your neighbor's report. Therefore. This is a point that is audited. It's important to file your raw data. Whatever you are analyzing should be filed and should be available at the time of audit. One more importance here in documentation that all these equa data will be seen, your reports and your filing, your input, whatever you have filed, your raw data all will be examined at the time of audit. But even before audit, these things have to be presented at the your management review meeting for them to understand how you are performing in your equa. So we'll come to talked about signing up for an equa program. We so talked about running an equa program. We talked about reviewing an equa. 
ECWA program. So now we have to think about how do you understand your ECWA reports. It's a very important thing that we have to discuss because we have seen in our experience that a lot of people participate in the ECWA program but really don't know how to interpret the reports. So interpretation of the reports is a very important aspect of your participation and your review also unless you know what to look for you wouldn't know what actually is the report is talking about. So there are 10 attributes the report has to tell you and some of them are very evident, some of them you may need understanding in. So let us consider the 10 aspects that an ICWA should tell you. Analyte name, naturally, units of reporting of the parameter, you would again that's a simple thing, survey sample ID, reported results, N, the number of participating labs is important that you have to understand the N of it and then the grade and the acceptability of your performance. And in the case of all your quantitative reports of tests which give you numerical reports, you need to know the mean, expected range, standard deviation, SDIs, slash Z score and other parameters for comparison. So, these are the four things we have been talking extensively on statistical controls and I am sure these are all now very familiar terms to you, mean, expected range, standard deviation, SDI. Note here you are not talking about your CVI. It is a very evident thing again that question should arise, why not CVI is that there is, you are not now looking at your precision here, you have got only one sample, one assay. So what kind of CVI can you get? You have only one sample to send the report of, therefore you are only talking about accuracy. So this is how ICWA is enabling your accuracy, you are only knowing, understanding how much of your value is away from the target mean or the group mean of every other consensus mean or whatever you want to call it. So here you are only talking about SDI or Z score is another name that is used and any other parameters used for comparison. The CVI I am talking with reference to the previous video on the consensus metrics where in your peer group data you get both SDI and CVI, you get an idea about your inaccuracy also precision in comparison to your Peers. So that's not applicable here, that's what I was saying. So we let's come to other desirable attributes. These 10 things are mandatory, it should be there on your reports and uh, you should understand to check each of these things very clearly when you interpret your reports and in addition if you get some desirable attributes are graphics and I'm sure all of you would have seen examples of uh, equal reports with graphics on it. These are the kinds of graphics they generally give, histograms, LJ-like plots, UND plots, UDN graphs are all there part of uh, different kinds of equal systems and we'll see some of those now. And in addition to graphics, cumulative reports are would be good to have like the end of the year you get a cumulative report on all your performance and it also would be good to have comparisons with quality specifications. We will see examples of all of these in our further discussions and this is a ECWA report and let us see how many of the attributes that we talked about in the first slide are being satisfied by this ECWA report. You are starting with your cycle, your sample number, the time of your sample lot number, all these things what that we talked about are reflected in this report. And then you talk about your results, the unit of your result, comparative statistics, you are seeing it an allied name. So pretty much everything that we talked about are there. If you look at the first page, everything is given in this report and whatever is missing in this particular report, it will be available in some other place of this. This is only a, again for teaching purpose only, this is not a promotion of any particular kind of an ICWA program, this is to demonstrate the attributes of a report that I am showing these slips. So this is another clip of a ICWA program, it is for hematology analyte method and it is just about platelet count, it is a name of your analyte, this is your unit that it is said here and then you are talking about the sample. There are five samples in one equa cycle and the reported results, the N, total number of labs participating, expected results, the mean, SD, SDI, acceptability. So everything is there. These are the minimum attributes that you should check when you are seeing a equa program. So this one does not give you any kind of graphics. This information is enough, more than enough to, for you to understand. Graphics will give you a quick ability to understand a thing quickly, but even without graphics, things are explained in this report. 
see the N here, there is a peer group, there is a method group and there is a mode which is all the people who are filing in the report and everywhere the N is specified. You may not be able to see the N, this is the N with under which the number is specified. In the next slide also you see the N of 36, 30. In the previous slide they were in thousands and in this one you have at least about 30 people. So let us look at the, the importance of N. If N or the number of participants are low. Now this N is, is a very important number everywhere. That was there in the internal quality controls also. And now we are talking about it in the external controls also. So if N is too low, statistics may not be calculated for that peer group by the PT provider. The higher the N, the better the estimate of the target value determined for that PT sample. And naturally, so the more number of participants are there, mean will be more robust and more accurate. The more data points can be used to calculate the standard deviation because the dispersion also will be more realistic. Higher the end, the less impact of aberrant values or and incorrectly defined outliers that will have on the group standard deviation or the mean. That is the importance of having a good number of n and a minimum of 30 should participants should be there in a program. That many samples should be there to make it statistically significant. So that is the importance of having the N. So always understand how many participants are there in this program before you enroll. After N, the next parameter that you would want to look at is the acceptable performance criteria. Every EQUA provider will define the acceptance performance criteria and it is a responsibility of the provider to clarify the method of acceptance or rejection. It's also the responsibility of the laboratory to understand the method of acceptance. So even if the provider doesn't tell you, it's your responsibility to check and understand that. And there are three major types of acceptance criteria which are defined. First one is a target value plus or minus a specified value. So if 100 people participating in the EQUA and the pooled average of all those 100 people is 100, uh, or maybe let's like say 200 and so 200 plus or minus something maybe like 10 or 15 so that's the specification that the equa provider will decide you have to understand how that number is derived at then there's a percentage we'll talk about it in the next slide and also multiple of the peer group sds if the mean is 200 and the standard deviation for that is five you may say it's acceptable up from 190 to 210, so two standard deviation or three standard deviation. Whatever it is, it is your responsibility to understand how the limits are set by your provider. Let's look at one example here. Here the expected result, this is for the same slide that we showed earlier. Expected result here is 43 to 72 when the mean is 57.4. So what could have been, if the mean is 57, what is the logic in assigning 43 and 72? Is it the standard deviation is only 2.8 that you can see here, 2.8 is your standard deviation. So even if it is plus minus, it doesn't tally. So you need to understand, this is the importance of asking your equa provider, what is your rationale, how do you set it? So for here in this one, what you have said, the equa provider is using the CLIA percentage total allowable error for platelet. So that is 25% is the total allowable error. So what the equa provider is doing is taking this 57.4 which is 25% minus is 43 and 25% plus is 71.8 which is rounded to 72. So that is the rationale in setting this. The provider is now using the total allowable error range of CLIA. So that is another option. So it's up to the laboratory to understand how these limits are set. So this is another example of NIQA. Here it is a standard deviation. This is the mean, is, it is given and this score is given. SD is not given in this report. So it is, you can always ask what was the standard deviation of your, this peer group, of this EQUA group. So it, here there is a flagging here. What does that mean? You're looking at the Z score and you're seeing a 2.77. So that means that there is a warning symbol here which says that your exceeding the limits, two is what they want you to subscribe to and if you are going beyond that, that means there is a flagging here. So some kind of an indication happens in your report also. So again, what is a, you need to understand what is the acceptance criteria. When you see a flagging, you need to understand what is the acceptance criteria. Z score is the same as SDI, the lab value or result minus the mean, which is the average of all the liars. You, 
Whenever an equa report goes to the equa provider, because some of them will be wildly away from the mean, so those will be eliminated. And the average is only of the inliers. The outliers will be excluded. So mean is the average of all inliers, lab value or result minus the mean of all inliers divided by the group standard deviation. And this should be less than three. So if that is the performance criterion that they are expecting, you need to understand this is a performance criterion and the equa provider, once you are crossing the two, they are flagging. So that is how you should understand what these reports mean. So navigating an equa report is, there are graphs, plots, figures, scores, so all these things, it's up to you to understand how this is happening. It's again, I'm reiterating this entire statement Again and again, it's a responsibility of the provider to clarify the scoring system, but it's also your responsibility to understand. You have to ask and understand how this happens. And this is standard deviation for performance assessment or SDPA. So there are various terminologies used by different equa providers and it's not practical to explain each concept. So the message here is that whatever be the terminologies used in your ICWA, it's your responsibility to understand and your ICWA provider will certainly explain these things to you so that you, you can interpret your reports effectively. So this is when I showed a slide earlier, I said additional attributes that would be good if you got in your ICWA reports. This is an example of a cumulative report. It's an over a period of time for 12 samples. All the outliers have been flagged and they have given the legend here. The red is a Z score which is more than 3 and this is a less than, the yellow is more than 2 but less than 3. So there are all these analytes which are flagging continuously but these are all looks like different analytes at different points in time. There's a total T4 which is flagged two times in a plan of six months. So there may be some error in that thing. So you, when you look at it, it gives you an overall impression of your performance. Is it a random thing or has it been building up and could I have detected it earlier? So these are the questions that you can ask. Could preventive action have been taken here? What is my Z score? Is it which way am I outliers and is there a pattern to my outliers. So if you get a cumulative report like that, there's a lot of things that you can think about and you can understand. So this is another kind of report which is comparison to the BB desirable, your deviation to what is desirable and then you see there's an outlier which has been marked here. So they say there is a 26% deviation for your HDL cholesterol and BB desirable says 11.63%. So that immediately brings your attention to some corrective action. So these are additional information your providers might give you and you understand what is available, what it may be there and they are not giving it to you unless you ask them. So make best use of your require program that you are signing up for. So this is another report. This is from the AIMS EQA program. This is for a CBC analysis. So there are some parameters, Z score among lab and Z score within the lab. So the, this particular EQA asked for two runs or three runs and uh, they calculate the in, intra run percentage difference and all, they will also give you some, some comment on your precision. Apart from your accuracy, which you are looking for through your Z score, they are also commenting on your internal performance of your variability of imprecisions. So then they give an additional comment here. They'll say the equa satisfactory results while you're talking about the internal quality assurance difference of MCH beyond the acceptance range and maybe a random error, rest of the precisions are satisfactory. So some kind of an idea of precision. That's an extra that they are giving you. They're asking for some additional information from you and with that they are giving you some kind of an input about your precision also. So you can take that act suggestion and do your appropriate corrective actions. One thing which I would like to comment here for people who are using fully automated analysis, five-part analysis, especially with the two modes of performance, there may be a cap piercing and a cap open mode. And uh, most of your internal controlling activity will happen on your cap piercing mode because that is a way, it is, that's the easier way to do it. And, but the AIMS equa samples that come to you, we do not have pierceable caps, so you have to open it. So that will be an open mode that you are going to use. So that tells you the importance of your quality evaluation of both your modes because you also would run samples on your secondary mode or your cap opening mode for samples with inadequate volume or 
whatever may be the reasons. So that also needs to get control and when, only when you see this kind of an outlier you will think, oh, but my precision is okay, my CVs are good, so why is this anomaly happening? So that will alert you to the need to control both your modes with some kind of harmonization or maybe that is something that you have to work in your laboratory because many of times this kind of flagging is because the secondary mode or the cap opening mode stays totally out of the control purview because all the controls are run in the cap piercing mode. That was just an aside, it's only for people who are using five part analyzers and this is another kind of a require and this is a CMC biochemistry equals this scoring system is called VIA scoring, variance index scoring and we'll talk about it in the next uh, slide. So this is since is very extensively used in India. You have to understand what all these terms mean. There are so many terms here, serial number, constituent name, method name, number of participants, your N, lots of participants. You can look at it and understand how many participants are there. Participants DV and CV, what are all these things? We'll talk about BCRM, range, your value, VIS, percentage bias, SDI. So you know these two terms here, you know these term here, this is something which you don't know, this is something which you don't know. So when you see these terms, call the provider and ask, what do these mean? What do I have to understand from all these things? Does it tell me something about my poor performance or my good performance. These are the questions that you have to stop and ask. There is an outlier here. For your VIS scoring, your minimum, the maximum the VIS can go up to is 200. Beyond that, that indicates some anomaly. And here is a VIS 400. And when you look at the percentage bias, it is 8 to 6 percent bias. And look at the SDI, it is minus 9 percent. So that means there is something terribly wrong with the triglyceride analysis. And there are other analytes are within, this is another one here, magnesium. Magnesium is having a 400 VIS minus 80 bias and 5 SDI. So these are all, we to already talked about SDIs or the Z scores should not go beyond 2. But other SDIs, other analytes look normal. Okay, so you, whenever you get an EQUA report back, you look at all these different parameters, performance indicators to see this is also a minus 15 percent uh, bias here. So this is minus 30 percent bias 26. All these analytes need to be checked out. Why are they going? Because there are multiple indicators here. SDI, even if it is within limits here, the SDI looks within limits, but there is a huge bias happening in ILP. So you need to look at why this is happening. You have to understand what is the meaning of this report, understand the terminology. So these are all important things you have to take into consideration while you are looking at your ECWA reports. Let us look at the VIS scoring in a little detail. VIS is the variance index scoring and is used by CMC Weller. It uses CCV chosen coefficient of variation and DV, designated value. We saw that in the report, designated value in calculation. CCV is allowable limit of error. It's like your TEA. CCV is a similar thing to TEA and the sum of both imprecision and bias. This method has been set and recommended by WHO after studying the performance of many Indian labs and it's a very validated method. So again, I'm just so that this because all of you, a lot of you doing VIS, I want to go into, I mean, same sequence, I want to make you understand the details. Calculation is done in two steps. The first step is percentage variation or percent V is equal to your value minus expected value, the same formula divided by expected value into 100. So you find out your bias from that. Reported value, expected value divided by expected value, just as you're finding your percentage bias. And the variance index is equal to percentage V divided by CCV into 100. So your bias divided by almost like your TEA, bias divided by your CCV, okay, CC chosen coefficient of variation. So this is what you are doing here. So let us look at an example. If in a glucose equal cycle, the expected value is 120 mg percent and the reported value is 95, variation of percent V is equal to 120 minus 95 is equal to 20.8. And the VIS will be 20.8 divided by 7.5, which is a CCV, into 100, which is your 277. So lower the VIS, better the lab's accuracy. Ideally, the VIS should be less than 100. 
the CMC scores all VI is less than 50 as zero score. That is a fantastic score to get. Any score over 400 is given as 400. It does not say how much it goes up, it just say more than 400 is 400, that means it is really bad. Any VI score more than 150 requires investigation and corrective action. Let us put it as any VI score more than 100 will require corrective actions. If you look at this slide, you look at all the VI scoring here. Some of them are good, there is a 1 0 for total bill ribbon and then you are coming to a 191, a 199, a 162, one. there are lots of analytes here which require attention. So, this is how you look at your report and understand whether this is an acceptable report or not. So, we have now looked into VIS and we said there are CCVs which are defined and there are some of the CCVs we have given some analytes. So, keep this in mind, this is a chart that you might want to look at whenever you get, if you are doing a CMC quiz and when you are getting the reports, you might want to tally these numbers. So, this slide might help you in doing that. So, this is one more report of VIS scoring and pretty much every analyte is not doing too well. And this is a histogram that we talked about the graphics. Graphics are immediately, it will get your uh, attention because of the, of course, the graphical representation. So, this is like a consensus mean for this value is whatever and this is our laboratory. So, immediately you will know, okay, you are behaving pretty okay, maybe a little on the higher side, but it is fine. So, that is give you immediate impression, all these histograms, that is what they do. So, when you look at this graph closely, put these two graphs together, you are seeing a bias at the high level and you are looking at which is this value that is breached to SDI and you see that is a 14.4 and which is this value that is breached of SDI. This is not clear in this picture, but if you look at the, your result this time, you will see it is again a 14.2. So, between these two points, you have not done any preventive or corrective action here. And then between these two, that 6 months of time between which you would have reported several patients at the higher end and that these were all errors. So, these are the preventions that you should be enabled to take when if you actually look closely at your reports. So, if there was any preventive action, this would not have happened. You already saw this and if you had corrected whatever that is, that this would not have happened. One of the reasons that you would want to think about again is a calibrator because most of the immunoassays will have multiple levels of calibrator and probably there is something wrong with the calibrator at that level. So, that is what is making this error. So, these are the thoughts you should think about while you see an error like this. So, we already talked about plots, the Levy Jennings like plot, that is what we have been talking about and the second plot that uh, according to concentration is called the UND plots and that allows quick and easy identification of trends and biases that we already saw that. And this is another example and we already talked about it in earlier video. An alkaline phosphatase with everything on the lower side, no corrective actions taken has not been noticed. There has been only one violation here, but it has already, it has been sitting on the below the or the zero score and everything is a negative SDI. Z score and it has not been paid attention to. And these are all errors that should be seen and corrected. These are all examples of not taking the adequate or correct action when you see reports like this. You have one violation, you have two violation, three violation, at least at this point you should figure out why, what is going wrong. And then there is another one which is, it has not hit the 2SD line yet to a standard deviation index line yet, but it is almost there and then once it is even going out and still no corrective actions have been taken. So, this is how the equas is not adequately used or misused. Another example of calcium, this is ok, there are a couple of violations and again you look at the concentrations where it is happening, it is 6, 8.4, but this, the, so that means if there is an error, there is again a graph which is going on the higher side at this 8.2 level, there is a negative. So, you would want to look at that and figure out why that is happening. This is another kind of plot, it is called a Uden plot and Uden plot is in the CMC hemostasis equals. So, Uden is when you both the levels, uh, there are two levels of cause that is given in one cycle, there is a low and high or a maybe normal and high or whichever that is and the two levels are plotted simultaneously with all the laboratories together and that is again a complex interpretation of it. So, even if you do not understand this, it is ok. If 
it is an equa schemes used to control samples of different levels in order to check the different clinical decision levels that's point number 1 this allows comparison of the relationship of each levels value to the group's performance union plot is a rectangular chart of which four angles correspond to the control limits of the two controls minus 4st plus 4st so that is an explanation that more about this is written in the qc module volume 1 you can refer to that even if you don't understand the whole technicalities of it there is no need to understand because it's unnecessary information but you have to look at the report this is a report format it's a bad picture but uh, you what you have to look at is these comments if you're doing a cmc hemostasis equals this says within consensus within consensus this is for pt and inr prothrombin and inr so this is a pt report that is inr report I'm not able to read much since this says within consensus that you are okay about it but if it says out of consensus then you have to actually understand what went wrong and do your corrective actions this is another example of this is nari equas i'm just going through all the indian equases and their reporting systems so that we understand what the report means and the nari equas calls this is known as the residual residual is mean and your deviation from your mean is called the residual and then there is a standard deviation index also the standard deviation is also given standard deviation index is also given and this is they also give a plot of the residual that's another terminology that is used in indian equasis so now we are going to that's about inter laboratory comparisons 5.6.3 one equa or the pt sample and now you are going to the second type of our programs which is inter laboratory comparison that is described is your exchange of samples exchange of sample where there is no formal pt program is available iso recommends exchange of samples with other laboratories as an alternate method 5.6.3.2 periodicity of testing acceptance criteria authority of review of acceptance should be defined for each analyte it's very important because it's a very informal process there is nobody to tell you what is going wrong like in the equa schemes and pts that we just talked about there are indicators of where you are going wrong and we can act upon those here there are to nobody to guide you you have to guide yourself through this process if you are doing that you write a good qsp what how will you define the periodicity how often and what are your acceptance criteria and who is going to review it and uh, what is the corrective action and that for each analyte you need to describe it separately so that everybody reads and understands the process so this is if you diagrammatically represent this your lab sample is going to two or maybe five or six i mean there's a limit to which you can do send your samples so the here the part the limitation itself is the very low n the the number of people who are participating itself is low and we already talked about unless there are about 30 there is no statistical significance here but in the absence of any other method this can be done so in frequency would it's 3 to 4 months frequency would be good but again it's a prerogative of the lab there is no guideline here so you can decide on whatever suits you so that your ultimate aim is that you don't make mistakes with your patient samples so one more mechanism is if you cannot send out your samples also there are some samples that let you cannot like for instance a semen analysis you there is no mechanism where you can send it out so there you have to use some other mechanism to understand the proficiency of the people who are actually reporting these results so there you can use an inter observer variance samples processed in the lab itself and mechanisms comparison again have to be established samples like clinical pathology maybe microscopy of urine or stool or semen may be evaluated through competency of the staff who routinely interpret so that has to be done because otherwise if you are just blindly allowing samples and signing it out signing out reports that is not acceptable there should be some process by which you assess the competency of the people and that's only acceptable in samples which there is no mechanism of even sending it out so that is your inter observer variance and then nabl 112 has some stipulations on inter laboratory comparisons and what it says is uh, non availability of formal national pt programs for analytes of interest only few laboratories maybe there are high end tests that only a few laboratories are performing so there again you can exchange samples with whoever you are comfortable with or it an nabl says it is an it has to be an nabl accredited lab that you are 
if you are looking for accreditation of that analyte and there is no ICWA program, then if you are sending it out, you have to send it out to a, an ABL accredited lab. Analyte measured is unstable for example, blood gases, ammonia. For those things you have to find that it is not even you cannot send it out, it is so unstable. So, that has to be some mechanism of inter observer variants or people who are doing it. The controlling has to be done by other mechanisms. Control material of the same matrix is not available. As the sample is completely consumed during the performance of the test example ESR, in these mechanisms you have to look at alternatives to have the proficiency tested. That is all. You need to get the proficiency tested for all these things. You have to define your mechanisms, document it and re keep records of all these activities. And again NABL 112 when the laboratory exchange samples with other laboratories as an alternative approach to EQUA, the following needs to be addressed. In the case of comparisons between two laboratories, one will function as a reference laboratory against the which the other will be compared. This is to be documented as an MOU. Where there are several laboratories, compare the result against the reference laboratory. So, there will be one laboratory. This is generally talking about very high end test where you need to decide who will be the reference laboratory and then you compare you because you need to decide that one person is correct here and that that is your reference laboratory. The results obtained shall be compared statistically for guidance. The laboratory may refer to the most current edition of CLSI document EP9 measurement procedure comparison and bias estimation using patient samples. So, that is one document that you can refer to. And the third group of interlaboratory comparison that we they said we will talk about is peer group and we had already talked about it. So, I will not go into the details now. So, whether it is your exchange of samples or inter observer variance, I hope that slide was clear for you. Here we explain the sequence of other methods that can be employed as an interlaboratory comparisons. Third is certified reference material, samples are previously examined, materials issue repositories and control materials that are tested daily in interlaboratory that is a peer group. So, this is one method we have already examined. So, we have already talked about in couple of other videos. So, we, I will not go into the details. So, that is also an accepted procedure provided there is no registered EQUA program available. And whatever the mechanism for example, the exchange of samples, inter observer variance, the documentation is extremely important. You need to document the laboratory 1, 2, the percentage difference and acceptance criteria and your comments documentation is extremely important. And now coming to the final part of the 5.6.3 is that troubleshooting and corrective actions. We already talked about how do you identify your errors and how to interpret the reports and your activity will not stop there. You have to go and find out what went wrong, very important. So, you are looking at many kinds of errors. One of the common kind of errors is the spurious errors. There is no reason, it is just carelessness. Ha this happens a lot with ICWA programs. So, you need to understand how to fill in your reports. Again, something that you need to check with your PT provider to see how do you fill in these reports because there are so many criteria that you have to, it is a big form with so many checks and columns and you may get confused. So, this is to be done carefully because you are spending money to do your ICWA and spuriously you defeat the purpose for no reason is, is something extremely sad. So, you have to be careful about how you fill in your reports. As ICWA is appraising the analytical part of the testing, all efforts should be directed at avoiding careless mistakes which will result in meaningless ICWA reports. Some of the instances are incorrect classification of testing methods. Whatever your method, when there is a method column, please fill it carefully, give it thought, look at your kit insert and make sure you write there the correct method. Otherwise, you will be evaluated with another group of people where you should have been evaluated with your peer, you will be getting evaluated with some other group. Incorrect classification of testing methods leading the service provider to analyze a lab's report with the wrong peer. One, incorrect units. So, whatever the units are, if you shift a decimal here and there, the equal is going to be like huge outliers like what we saw 400 plus VIS or whatever 9 Z score. So, incorrect units, conversions leading the service provider to classify the reports as incorrect because they will just look at the numbers and if you are not careful then they, they are not going to call you up and ask was there a mistake in your decimal, you, they will just mark it as incorrect. 
incorrect sample tested, they, if the, some of the equa providers give you one year's worth of sample or 12 cycles worth of samples and then you have to pick up this month, this is August, you have to pick up the August sample. If you are picking up the June sample and doing it in August, uh, naturally you are going to get a wrong report. If there is a serial number or a lot number in the life lies testing material, caution must be exercised in identifying the sample correctly. So these are all the spurious errors that you just defeat the entire purpose. So be careful while you are, you are numbering, you are picking up your sample, you are entering your reports and your units, all these things should be very carefully checked. And then there are technical errors also that happen. This is again uh, the self-defeating things, the technical errors that generally happen is in not including all the life lies material, very common. And you will get a consistent negative bias from the top to bottom if you put too much of uh, dilution material water into it or if you put too little, you will get a positive error immediately alerting you to some kind of a constitution error. If you are not using calibrated pipettes, your volume you may be having to put 5 ml and you may end up putting 4.5 ml because your pipette has not been calibrated or more, whichever way the thing. So, you are going to have again unnecessary errors coming in, not following the instructions for reconstitution. Very carefully understand what, because the PT provider has made a protocol depending upon how their data, their analysis, they will say keep it for 5 minutes or keep it for 10 minutes or keep it in the fridge or whatever it is. You have to follow the instructions correctly so that you come at the correct result. And finally, the transcription errors. Most of the errors happen in these places also. So, the spurious errors for no reason carelessness, these are technical errors, but again carelessness. So, these should be avoided. And actually, finally, if you have everything right and you get wrong reports, that is what is reflecting your analytical phase errors. And as we already know that equa is a measure of your accuracy and something to do syst with systematic uh, errors. Immediately think of your reasons for your systematic errors. And then you ask yourself all those questions that you have to ask. Relook at the IQC data, important first thing. Immediately when you see an error, you look at the internal quality control data. Are there trends? Is, it, is there a bias? Uh, is it high? It is low? What is happening to the IQC data? change the reagent. Has there been a change in the reagents recently? Change in the calibrators. Look for acceptance testing details. Look at the lot verifications. We talked about the lot verifications. Was it correctly done? Was it okay? At that point itself, did you pick up some error that you did not attend to? Storage of reagents on calibrators, is it okay? Change in the environment, water quality, has the operator changed? Investigate equipment performance like aspiration system, incubators, cuvette systems, optical system, refrigeration systems and everything has to be correctly done and documented. And one more thing I would like to tell you is that once your equa reports have been filed, you do not just throw off your samples, equa samples, you can freeze it, you can put it at minus 20 and you can use it as some kind of a control mechanism. You can, when you have a doubt, you can use, especially if your reports have, you, when you get your reports and they are good reports. These materials can be used as control and also once you get the report and if there is an error, you can always recheck and see what exactly was the problem there. And especially you look at the IQC data at that point and there was some bias and now it is working well, you rerun and you will find it fine. So, you know that something was wrong at that point. So, it again enables you to take the some kind of a preventive action here. 5.6.4 is the last part of the 5.6 clause and it talks about the comparability of examination results. And when you are talking about the comparability, what you mean is you suppose you have two equipment in your laboratory which are doing the same test by two different methods or maybe the same method but two equipment and then you have some kind of a difference in the value and a patient comes today and you are doing the test on machine A and tomorrow you are doing it on machine B and then naturally there is a difference in the value. So, that adds to all your uncertainties that we talked about because you have got two machines sitting there. Even if it is the same analytical system, we saw that there is an uncertainty. So, if there are two analytical systems, naturally it is going to have some kind of difference. So, you have to establish the comparison between the two machines. That is a clause, that is what this clause 5.64, 6.4 talks about. 
And NABL 112 also has stipulations about this comparability of results and it says more than one measuring system where the measurements are not traceable to the same reference material because the, the calibrator that you use in one equipment may not be the calibrator that is your in another equipment and also biological reference intervals could totally be different. So, if you are reporting on the same format with the same biological reference interval and today it was 100, tomorrow it is 120 and then what will the patient supposed to understand from that. So, you have to establish the comparability between these two systems and NABL recommends that it is done at least twice a year using suitable statistical procedure like bland altman plot or regression analysis and a written procedure and complete record of such data will be should be retained till the next assessment. So, that is another importance that the comparability of data be retained. So, another tool that is available in the QC soft is a tool for harmonization. The purpose of it is comparable to this, but not exactly bland Altman. That tool is uh, called harmonization. So, that is for your uh, if you want to harmonize two equipment, you can uh, use that it only gives you the percentage difference between two methods and that will give you or two machines the acceptance criteria again have to be set by the laboratory and you have to decide and it is just as a last option when you do not have enough QC in your laboratory to run on maybe three or four systems that you have in your laboratory there you can probably use this and it is not like any kind of standard guideline it is only an option to enable at least some kind of a safeguarding of your analytical system. So, that brings us to the end of this discussion on quality controls, the entire 5.6 and I hope you still remember the path that you took and I would direct you to look at this slide once again that you started off with distributions and then went to the Gaussian distribution and then we said how Gaussian can be put on an LJ and then how the what are the rules that direct you to monitor an LJ and we talked about what errors can be detected on the LJ and how to make a correct LJ by assigning the correct mean and uh, standard deviation and then we also talked about how to handle a new lot of QC and then put those right numbers on the chart. From there we took a diversion and we took went into the another concept of quality assurance which is bias and then you followed it up by computing of the bias and then you talked about total error, how can you find the total error and then we talked about allowable error and we said how we can compare the total error to total allowable error and that is how we can set quality specifications or tolerance limit. And we looked at one more option, sigma metrics, where you can use quality specifications to have tolerance limits. There we concluded the 5.6.1 and 2, where we are talking about internal control protocols. And then we moved on to 5.52 mechanisms for termination of uncertainty of measurement and also for lot verification. Both of them have a little different purpose up from what 5.6 is talking about. And then we came back to 5.6 and we talked about the interlaboratory comparisons. We did it in two videos. One is just about the consensus based metrics, the CVI and SDI and the second in the second we looked at the available PT and EQUA programs and other mechanisms to assure proficiency. So, that brings us to the end of the video. I hope these videos have been beneficial and that you will utilize it well to ensure the quality of examinations in your laboratory. Thank you very much for watching and uh, we would like feedbacks on these videos from all of you and any questions we, you can put it on the website and we will be very happy to answer all your questions. Thank you very much.